Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I want to talk about the historical background of the 20th century literature in England and, and uh, the, the focus here would be um, on the main incidents, both uh, philosophical and historical, which has affected and influenced uh, the literature which is written even today. Uh, so uh, let us begin with this painting by Picasso. Um, it's a cubist art and what, what you see here represents what was up at the beginning of the 20th century. The fragmentation, as you see, the fragmentation is a key word, a key term. When we talk about modernism, about 20th century's uh, first trends of literature and art, uh, modernism, generally speaking, we can say, did not start in literature. It started first in architecture, the, the, the more concrete form of art. And then it was conveyed to such arts as painting and later on, literature could gain that that vibe uh, and wave uh, from other forms um, uh, of art. Uh, so in this painting, we see fragmentation. We see a self, which is not really a self. This is a portrait, but this portrait is not vivid. We cannot talk about its specifications, its details, the details of the face, the details of the body, the hand. So this is, uh, the, and even the background, the foreground and the background, are merged. This is what 20th century was like about. Um, everything solid, according to Marx, was just melting into the air and everything was momentarily changing. And this painting could, could just convey the spirit. So the, if, if we talk about modernism and modernist literature, uh, we can search the roots in late 19th century. The roots of modern literature are in the late 19th century um, in such movements as art for art's sake or the aesthetic movement, the decadent movement. So the aesthetic movement, this insistence on art for art's sake, um, um, assaulted um, meta caste assumptions about the nature and function of art. In art for art's sake, the main purpose of art was considered to be uh, the pleasure and the pleasure given to the audience. Not more than that. Um, the realist fiction written at the time of the Victorian era uh, was a social kind of fiction, always with a message in it. But in art for art's sake movement, the focus was on the work of art itself, not the morality. Oscar Wilde had famously stated that we don't have immoral art, we have immoral minds. So check your mind, not, not check, the, check the work of art. The work of art's task function is not to give you a message, is not to uh, to help you gain a lesson from it. So this is art for art's sake. And because of this, because the artists were more involved and engaged with their uh, artwork, uh, they, they, and the pleasure they would have taken from it, the impression they would uh, have from it. So the, everything was now based on the impression on the artist. And they didn't care about the audience, whether they understand it or not. This is the, this is not the, the function of art to be understandable, to be comprehensible to everyone from this time on. Rejecting Victorian notions of the artist's moral and educational duties, statism helped widen the breach between the writers and the general public, resulting in the alienation of the modern artist from society. Generally speaking, uh, the modernist art is an elitist art. Um, it, it, it is uh, an art uh, which is uh, culturally minded. It, it uh, just relies on the understanding of a small group of people uh, who, who share the same codes of meaning with the artists, not necessarily the general audience, the general public. The general public was not considered capable enough for this art. So art is for, not only for the art's sake, but only for the artist's sake. And uh, a great divide, a great gap starts uh, to to uh, uh, to occur between the people, uh, the the ordinary people, the masses, and these intellectuals, these artists, and um, these artists thought that they understand everything. They should shed light from above on the people. They 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 task is to enlighten the people, to find the meaning amid all this chaos of the beginning of the 20th century. And, and this came on the side of the artists uh, was not enough, the people could not understand anyway. The, the, the artists were prophets, but nobody could understand these prophets. And this is somehow represented in some works. This alienation is evident in the lives and works of the French symbolists and other late 19th century Bohemians. 
um, who, who only thought about arts, they were careless about what was happening around them, who repudiated conventional notions of respectability and as underlies key works of modern literature, such as James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and James Joyce's Ulysses uh, were both published in 1922 and, and they are the platforms uh, for the 20th century modernist literature in English or Anglophone world of literature. And look at this one, this painting, it's called Synchrom in Orange. Uh, to uh, from Russell Morgan. And this painting, we see um, the, uh, the basic colors, uh, the major colors and the major shades, and uh, some geometrical shapes. Uh, and this is considered a work of art. So, so the work of art, and you see the fragments of the, the breakages uh, all appearing in this painting. Uh, the, this work of art is, is concerned with form. One thing happened in the 20th century um, and concern, uh, concerning the realism. The realistic literature in the 19th, 19th century, in the Victorian era, was focused on the social reality. It was a mirror held up to the society, showing the details of society, providing every kind of information a reader uh, was supposed to know before understanding the story, the narrative. Uh, but but at the beginning of the 20th century, in modernist times, because uh, the, the writers wanted to show a reality, but they, they were not concerned with the society, they showed the reality of form. So the rea uh, realism in 20th century art and literature focuses on the form. Instead of looking outward, the works of uh, and the artists are looking inward. The work of art is now reflecting upon itself and self-reflectivity becomes a code in art. And here, this artist has shown it, that, that he reflects, the artist had reflected on the forms which shape and shapes which give shape to other forms, the basic ones, the geometrical ones, the basic colors, everything is in there. And instead of focusing on, um, on, on a subject matter, this painting focuses on painting itself, on the basics and the rudiments of the art of painting. So the growth of public education in England as a result of the Education Act of 1870, which finally made elementary schooling compulsory and universal, led to the rapid emergence of a mass literature population at, um, at home, a new mass produced popular literature and new cheap, uh, cheap journals them, the yellow press were directed. And these masses could not understand this. These masses were not concerned with self-reflexivity of art and such topics. They were concerned with, um, with uh, surface stories, with, with one thing about a life that they can understand. Reader Digest, for example, journals like Tat for Tat, magazines, uh, addressing this group of people were popular. But at the same time, art was going to this direction. So the gap is here. The gap between the yellow press and the work of art which is concerning of the work of art itself which is self-reflexive the, the, here the people want something more common and the art is not common at all the art is looking through looking inwardly we can say so um, a divide happened between the forms of art, the audience for literature split up into high bros, middle bros and low bros, low bros and mid bros uh, were not addressed in by such artists like but hybrids uh, were actually the major audience and the segmentation of the reading public developing with unprecedented speed into an unprecedented degree helped widen the gap between the popular uh, popular art and art steamed uh, only by the uh, sophisticated and the expert. So we have an elite group uh, who understand specific work of art and or literature, and we have ordinary people who who can merely have a grasp of a simple story. And uh, this bridge yawned ever wider with the 20th century emergence of modernist iconoclasm. And, and the break with the past, breaking with the past convention, so the people could not understand that because it was not familiar. The, the, the artists had broken the previously um, uh, organizational structures or traditions of art. And avant-garde, avant-garde means advanced guard, experimental literature, music, and the visual arts. So art, art is divided.
now and uh, the, the, the focus of this slide was on this topic uh, but at the same time uh, there was another issue Victorianism Victorianism as a culture already existed in the minds of the people in the mentality of the people and the artists were rejecting it so the people were living and in, in that kind of uh, late Victorian atmosphere or middle Victorian age but but the artists were somewhere else so this was again another issue the way of all flesh uh, which was uh, completed posthumously uh, and it, it remained unpublished till 1903 uh, was the bitterest uh, by uh, actually an artist who was a critic of the Victorian codes, Victorian norms. It was a, the bitterest indictment of English literature of the Victorian way of life. Samuel Butler in this work addresses uh, the, the uh, the cruelty of the Victorian family, especially the Victorian father, and how the Victorian father tries to uh, tries to uh, impose his codes of morality, his religious codes, his oppress onto his uh, his son, and his son rejects all that at the end of the day. Uh, but but before reje that rejection to happen, uh, the son has ruined his personal life. And, and, and the other work of art, but, um, um, literature, which mocks the Victorian um, values is the imminent Victorians. The high tide of anti-Victorianism was marked by the publication in 1980 of the classic ironic debunking Little Strach's collection of biographical essays, Eminent Victorians. In Eminent Victorians, Little Strach addresses uh, five uh, eminent Victorian figures. Um, uh, including Florence Nightingale, and he tries to show that these are not icons, these are even less than ordinary people, so there is nothing to celebrate about these group of people. Uh, and here in this painting you see a quintessential Victorian image. Uh, th th there are a lot of people here, many of them are, ne are not even caring about this, these works of art. So the work of art is not the concern, the bourgeoisie kind of concern for, for have for having an image of all these, to, to, to have seen them is more important. So while people are still living with the, with the bourgeois, bourgeois values of uh, mid and late Victorian era, the artists are rejecting them. Uh, so uh, why all these things happening anyway? Um, the, the modernist artists and generally speaking, the human beings at the beginning of the 20th century who are living in the West are are just looking at a world they cannot know. Everything is just changing. According to David Harvey, the only thing which is not changing, the only stable thing in this world is change itself. So oh, the, the, the boundaries are vacant, the, the people uh, ca cannot find a uh, unified system of belief. Um, and we have, I have discussed this in, uh, in my slides on Victorianism, and then you can check, it, check out that video. The Victorian era, um, in, in mid, late, and mid and late Victorian era, Christianity, the institution of the church is rejected. Uh, so so may, maybe the social cement, the only thing, uh, the, the, the major group of, uh, of the members of society were believing in is just broken. And uh, the, the different sciences are just advancing uh, with a rapid speed. Uh, so, so the people, you know, the, the world has become chaotic. Everything is just moving forward and the people are, are, are lagging behind. By the dawn of the 20th century, traditional stabilities of society, religion, and culture seem to have weakened the pace of change to be accelerating. And uh, the, the, the human beings felt lost in that world. Uh, the unsettling force of modernity profoundly challenged traditional ways of structuring and making sense of human experience. Sciences were in there, religion was rejected, uh, the, the the industrial revolution had happened, so everything was rapidly just changing, and uh, it, it seemed to be chaos. And this is the face of the human beings at the time. They, they were lost. They, they, could, they could not uh, have a coherent uh, shape because the world lacked that kind of a shape. Uh, the, everything is just multimorphous, we can say. And here in this slide, you can see another form of um, uh, modern art. It's, an, it's a sculpture, and you see the sculpture doesn't convey specific meaning. It, it shows science, it shows uh, the rules of, of physics, for example. It shows some shapes, it shows the fragments again. 
and some major colors and shades. Nothing more than that, but you see emotion in this, a dynamism in the sculpture. So sculptures were fixed, sculptures were static, but here you see a dynamic form of sculpture. So because of the rapid space of social and technological change, because of the mass dislocation of populations by war, empire, and economic migration, because of the mixing close quarters of cultures and classes in rapidly expanding cities, Modernity disrupted the old order, appended ethical and social codes, custom to doubt previously stable assumptions about the self, community, the world, and the divine. And this is called the condition of modernism. And uh, there are not only in these fields, in the field of science and the field, field of religion, there were some changes. Uh, we have some major changes in the structure of thinking and the structure of feeling, uh, to use Raymond Williams' term terminology. Uh, there were new sciences um, at hand and there were new philosophies of life. So early 20th century writers were keenly aware that powerful concepts and vocabularies were emerging in anthropology and new science, the science of man, anthro means human being, anthropology is the science of the human beings, it, it shares the history of mankind, psychology, the, the science introduced by Sigmund Freud, this figure, philosophy especially influenced by, by a figure, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, and the visual arts that reimagine human identity, for example, Picasso's cubism, uh, reimagine human, uh, human identity in radically new ways. Let's start with uh, Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis. Sigmund Freud had famously written an article uh, which is called The Creative Artist, uh, Creative Writer. And in The Creative Writer, he explores the ways in which an artist is influenced by, by his psychology. Uh, but uh, Freud's uh, most important work is the interpretation of dreams which was published in 1900. In 1900, um, just as, as uh, at the turn of the century, Sigmund Freud wrote something uh, which had revolutionized the notion of the self for all the time. Um, it actually, uh, Freud rejects the Cartesian be uh, belief of the self. Uh, Rene Descartes had famously stated that, I think, therefore I am. For, so for Descartes and the adherence of his philosophy, uh, a human being is generally a rational being. But for Freud, uh, a self is divided into the conscious and the unconscious. And he thinks that most of our decisions, most of our thinking is influenced by the unconscious portion and conscious part of our mind. So the conscious mind is not actually that much working. So Freud believed that not only the human self is a divided self, is a fragmented self. It is divided between it, ego and superego. It was also divided between the conscious and the unconscious, but also um, it, it, it is not rational. Its decisions are mostly uh, based on the suppressed and repressed feelings, many of them influenced by the childhood incidents and the process of the resolution of the Oedipus complex, to be more precise. Uh, anyway, in that essay, The Creative Writer, Sigmund Freud explains that the writer has the art, has the capability, the capacity to turn something which is very um, egoistic, very um, self-based into something artistic. And the, and the process of sublimation happens, we can say. The, so the artist has the power, uh, let's say the genius, uh, to change something ugly or something um, uh, which is sexual, or which is based on the fears and traumas of the self, of his self or herself into something beautiful. And this is, uh, the, the, this is based on, for example, the process of dreaming and mechanisms involved in a dream as well. Uh, so so uh, as children, we, we fantasize things. We have uh, imaginary worlds. And the artist is someone who turned those imaginary worlds into something new. So he thinks that's why we have many, many forms of literature and art in which the ego or um, or the uh, hero is in there. It, the hero is actually a, a turning, a changing form, a changed form, let's say, of the artist himself. So his majesty ego is every, everywhere. And you see in literature, in art, in cinema, we have a male 
heroes, for example, every woman is infatuated by them, that they are always safe, they are always uh, the vectors, they are always the winner. So this is the case, for example, with the with self of a man or a male self, or uh, then the, it's very basic, I know, but Terry Eagleton has used uh, this example. He says the sublimation happens, for example, uh, for an architect, uh, for a male architect who changes his phallic ideals into long, um, into actually long buildings, into, sorry, into tall buildings, into high, um, uh, you know, actually skyscrapers, for example. So th this is the phallic in form of a work of art. I know this is, this might seem ridiculous, but it, but it explains what Freud is talking about. And uh, the, in among modernist artist D.H. Lawrence, for example, was influenced by these ideas, of course, indirectly. D.H. Lawrence knew something of Freud's ideas uh, uh, through his wife, Frida, who was German, but he, he never read for his ideas directly, but in his work, he has, he has addressed the idea of Oedipus Complex, for example, the rocking horse winners, sons, of, sons and lovers, all of them has this idea behind. And Dish Lawrence himself has somehow influenced by that Oedipus Complex in his personal life. His father was working um, uh, in a mine, he was a miner, and um, his mother uh, was a former teacher. So, the, and the father was always absent, the mother always present. So, the, his ma his mother has a very powerful presence in his life, and he somehow himself suffered from a deepest complex. Who, so he found something personal in those ideas, and he reflected them in his works. So, D. H. Lawrence adapted the deepest complex to interpret and present his relationships with his parents, though rejecting for his negative definitions of the unconscious, and rejecting some other sexual uh, undertones of Freud's analysis of the self. Uh, another influential figure uh, is uh, James Fraser. James Fraser has written uh, the volumes of the books, uh, two volumes of the book called Golden Bough. In the Golden Bough, he explores the roots of human myth and um, one major co contribution of Fraser in this work is that he considers uh, the, the Christianity, another myth, and Jesus Christ, uh, just one God among other gods of mythology. Also in the early 20th century, Sir James Fraser's Golden Bough and other works of anthropology were altering basic concept conceptions of culture, religion, and myth. T.C. Eliot has famously observed that Fraser's work influenced our generation profoundly, and he himself, T.C. Eliot himself, was uh, uh, was uh, influenced by Fraser's Golden Bough, especially in his wasteland. And the critic Lionel Trilling suggested that perhaps no book has um, had so decisive an effect upon modern literature as Fraser's. Uh, and this idea is uh, basically addressed in uh, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. For both anthropologists and modern writers, Western religion was now decentered by bending place in a comparative context as one of numerous related mythologies with Jesus Christ linked to primitive fertility gods thought to die and revive in concert, uh, concert with uh, the season. So uh, Jesus Christ is a sacrificial scapegoat, um, another god who sacrificed sacrifices himself for the sake of the fertility, and such gods were abandoned um, in forms of Greek, in Greek mythology and uh, Nor uh, Norse mythology and other forms of mythologies of mankind. So according to, um, let, let's say, uh, the ideas of uh, the American poet Will Stevens, uh, a new metaphor is lent to God. A religion is dead in its previous form, but new metaphors are available. And uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's ideas have both influenced modernist and postmodernist philosophies. Uh, Nietzsche had announced the death of God and he has repudiated Christianity and his ideas about life, about the Superman, about uh, instead of God, we have the Superman. So God is not there, but we have Superman as the module. Uh, you can explore his ideas if you're interested in Habib's book on, uh, on, uh, on the chapter Nietzsche. Um, and um, if, if one time you forgot about what modernism is, just remember these two lines from uh, W.B. Yeats's Second Coming, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loose upon the world, we, the things are falling apart, that fragmentation, the center cannot hold. Modernism moves from one center to another, it's a constant process of destructive creation and creative destruction, and uh, all the time they are just creating new modes of writing, new modes of representation, and they are changing it constantly 
recently, and mere anarchism upon the world uh, might refer to, to the historical incidents of war, for example. And this painting by K Kandinsky also shows that fragmentation, that falling apart of the things. You see, again, the major geometrical shapes in the major colors, and uh, you, you see these combinations, for example. But one thing prominent in this painting is a different representation of clock of time. Time is one of the obsessions of the modernists. They, they, they are always concerned about time and how they are, they are just put into time, how they are related to the past. What is the relationship they have with, the, with present and future is a major concern with them. Uh, James Joyce, a famous states and has used as the history as a nightmare from which we are trying to evade. And, and, and this nightmare of history and time is represented in this painting by Kandinsky. And when they ask Ezra Pound, uh, what do you mean by modernism and these modernist trends? He said to make it new. Ezra Pound believed that, okay, there is a past tradition and he really respected them. And he thought that uh, we, should, we should actually make something new about them to add up something, to contribute something. And suppose that this is the past and this is what modernism is. There are some building blocks in there from the past literature and the past forms and conventions, but this is what modernism contributes to it, a new window, actually, we can say. Uh, but people have in, in, among in this among this chaos, amidst this chaos, the people, some people, especially the upper classes, for continuing their luxurious way of living. So Edwardian's term applied to English cultural history suggests a period in which the socio economic stabilities of the Victorian age, country houses with numerous servants, a flourishing and confident middle class, strict hierarchy of social classes, reminded remain sorry unimpaired, though on the level of ideas a sense of change in liberation existed. Georgian refers largely to the lull before the storm of all the first. King Edward was Queen Victoria's son uh, and King George his son and uh, the grandfather of Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, the, it's so the Great War, the First War, what happened? That war is the bitterly skeptical and anti-heroic work of uh, the war poets Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Isaac Rosenberg, and other war poets makes clear, produced major shifts in the attitude toward Western myth of progress and civilization. It showed that the Westerners, um, unlike the idea of progress, which thought that uh, teleologically speaking, they're moving towards a talos, towards the ultimate pro progress and prosperity of mankind, they're moving toward, um, at, let's say, catastrophe, um, and um, no progress would end up um, in a kind of prosperity. The post-war dissolution of the 1920s resulted in part from the sense of autostration and practical collapse during a war in which unprecedented millions were killed. So the, the, the idea of progress ended up in murder, ended up in war, and uh, you know different forms of it, you know, Luftwaffe of the Germans, for example. And the tank, uh, let, it, let me add uh, some historic fact here, the tank was uh, the innovation of the English in the, tw in, in the First World War. And and they say if it was not for tank, maybe um, in, uh, the English and England and his allies could not win the war over Germany. And here you can see some pictures from the war: Royal Irish Rifles in a communications trench, first day on the Somme, 1916. It was a, it is the name of a battle. King George V front left, and a group of officials inspect a British munitions factory in 1970. British 55th Division soldiers blinded by tear gas during the Battle of Stairs, France, 10 April 1918, and the biological weapons were used for the first time by the Germans in this war, unfortunately. And uh, tanks and parrot, they were the winners of the war, the tanks, in London at the end of the World War I. 
Uh, but anyway, in winning a war, Great Britain lost an empire because uh, the, it different, its different colonies started to react. They, they wanted independence. And the basic reason behind the First World War was the colonies because new countries, new nations wanted to share the material resources of the world. 84% of the world was colonized. So uh, and 16 countries, 16% uh, of the uh, of the whole uh, population of the world were using uh, and abusing the rest. And these new nations, Germany and Italy wanted, new, um, wanted a share in that and it was not possible. So, so the world were happening. And you see how, how English Empire had expanded till 1914 and it, it is just uh, losing its power um, later on at the end of the war. In 1919, they are still in the war and they are just conquering new countries, new lands. Uh, but this does not continue, you see. This is 1938. And after the Second World War, um, it, even, it was even intensified. And let, let me just uh, let, share this with you. In, this is 1959, and England is just shrinking into a small island at the western corner of Europe. 1974, as you can see, just Falkland is here, and 2007. Uh, one of the results, one of the uh, consequences of centuries of imperialism and colonialism uh, was the hybrid literature of the of the former colonies. So writers from Britain's former colonies published influential and innovative novels, plays and poems, hybridizing their local traditions and varieties of English with those of the empire. So we have the, the voice of these people talking about their own culture and uh, and history, but they are doing it in the language of the colonizer. The names of the Nobel Prize winners, Wola Shrinka from Nigeria, Nadine Gordimer uh, uh, from South Africa, Derek Walker and West Naipaul, Naipaul from um, Caribbean islands, and James Kotsi from South Africa were added to the annals of literature in English. And later on, Seamus Henney, of course, uh, from Northern Ireland could win the Nobel Prize. Um, colonization in rivers, uh, therefore, was a phenomenon in there. Uh, formerly, uh, the colonizers went to those lands, but now it is a, it's a reverse movement. The people from the foreign, former colonies are now migrating to the mother country. Colonization in rivers was encouraged with forced labor shortage in England and the scarcity of work at home. Um, and this was my explanation of the historical background uh, of the 20th century English literature. Um, in my next videos, I will explore different genres, um, fiction, poetry, and drama uh, in the uh, English literature of the modernist era. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope I can see you in my next videos.